This is a second video that will serve as a, an introduction to Taylor's theorem. So if you haven't watched the first one, it's where I introduced the concept of a Taylor polynomial to a function centered at some point x0 for any particular degree that you like. And so I, know, I denoted that function by pn, and if you watched the previous video, you saw that pn is a pretty good approximation to the function f for the values that are near x0. And so maybe in symbols, we'd say pn or f is approximately equal to the function pn near x0. What we want to do is make that a little bit more precise, right? This approximation suggests that, well, it might be off by a little bit. So let's actually take the difference between those two functions, f and pn, and we'll denote that by rn, so that's a new function. And what we'll think of that difference, rn, being the difference f minus pn, we'll call that the error of the approximation. So in other words, how much is the polynomial off by if you use it to approximate your function f near the point x0? And uh, notice if you rearrange this equation and solve it for f, it's trying to tell me that my function is exactly equal to the Taylor polynomial of degree n centered at x0 plus rn which again we'll think of the error in the approximation which you're like okay yeah that makes sense if this is how much i'm off by if i add that to pn i should get exactly f back so i've got a little picture for you too let's say that uh, pn is the yellow polynomial there and if you can i'll try to zoom in a little bit my ipad would cooperate there i guess that's a little bit better um you see that my point that I care about is x0. So what I'm trying to say is, if I look a little bit further away from x0, that pink point x, you know, I see the yellow and the red aren't super close to each other. So I'm gonna measure that vertical distance between them, and that's what uh, rn is gonna be. So like in that picture, rn would be negative since pn is on top, uh, but you subtract pn. Anyway though, rn again is just the, the distance between the two, so it's not signed or anything. So what can be said about rn? What can we say about it? And Taylor's theorem helps us with that. So let's uh, n be a natural number, take a closed interval from a to b, call that i. Let's say you've got a function such that uh, all of its derivatives are continuous, so its first n derivatives, I should say, are continuous uh, on this interval, and that the next derivative, the n plus first one, it exists on the open interval from a to b. Notice though, like, like I'm not assuming that the last n plus first derivative, if you wanna think of it that way, is continuous. It might not be nice, but at least it exists. So if x0 is a point in i, then for any x that's also an i, we should be able to find a point between x and x0. And in this case, I'm not assuming that x is to the left of x0 or anything like that. So I'm being a little bit vague with c between x and x0, such that the following happens though, that the function f of x is exactly equal to this polynomial. And so what is that? You see that I've colored it in yellow to emphasize that, well, that's pn from the previous video that you watched plus this new thing that's in pink. And what's kind of neat about it is if you compare, say, this term to the pink term, well, it looks like it's kind of naturally continuing that same form, just with the n plus first one. But what you notice is, is that it's not evaluated at my point x0. I'm saying I can find some point kind of near x0 maybe called c that'll, uh, that'll have the same form here. So what we want to do is prove this theorem here, that f of x is actually equal to um, this polynomial. So how do we do that? So the proof, so let's say x0 and x are in your interval, and let's denote the closed interval just between x and x0, so with x and x0 and brackets on the ends, we'll call that j. And again, I'm not assuming that x is to the left of x0 or vice versa. So this proof is a little bit of acrobatics with define and functions that kind of have the properties that we want. So let's define capital F to be this function from j, which again is my interval that has endpoints x0 and x, uh, from j to the reals by the following. So the formula for capital F is f of x minus a whole bunch of stuff. And what I hope that you maybe notice is it looks like you're subtracting the Taylor polynomial and notice the variable is t here. So be careful, t is the variable of this function, so we're treating something like this as constant since it only depends on x. Now, something to notice about f here when you plug in the point x0, which again is supposedly like the special point that I'm interested in, the center if you want to call it that, when you plug x0 in, remember you're plugging that in for t, so notice like I didn't change the x here, right, it stays the same, you change all the t's to x0 when you do that, and uh, what is this then exactly equal to? That looks exactly like pn. So this would be, I'll recolor them now, and maybe I'll factor the negative out of each of these and put it out front. What I'm trying to emphasize is that that's f minus pn, which should be the same thing as rn from our little discussion before we talked about um, Taylor's theorem here. 
So that's what f of x0 does. That's why f's not just picked randomly. f is a nice function so that when you plug in x0, it actually is equal to rn. That's kind of cool. Now, the next thing we want to do is look at the derivative of this. And remember, when I say derivative, I mean with respect to t. So when you take the derivative, like this up here, that would be 0 since it's constant with respect to t. So I would get minus f prime. That's this here. And then here, for this piece, minus this stuff, you'd have to do the product rule. Sorry, this part here. You need to do the product rule on that. So you'd have like the derivative of this would be the second derivative times x minus t minus f prime of t times the derivative of x minus t, which would just be one, and so on. So when you differentiate each of these terms here, again, you're using the product rule since they've both got a t. Um, okay, cool. And so what I hope that, or maybe you notice in here, is that a bunch of good stuff is gonna cancel out. So like in particular, when I do minus f prime of t, I see I'm gonna get a plus f prime of t, and those would cancel, and what I claim is, all of those lower order terms cancel, and what you're left with then is just the very last one, uh, minus fn uh, x minus t to the n power here. So you just really get the last term out of that. Cool. And uh, oh, I think one more thing, I think a minus should come out of each of these as well, since when you do the chain rule, um, you get a minus out of that. So I hope that explains this minus sign out here. Okay. So let's define another function, g. And let's say g is our fancy function capital F minus x minus t over x minus x0 to the n plus 1 times the value f at x0. So that's a constant there. And why is this g cool? Well, when you plug in x0 into this, this would be f of x0. And then and this would be uh, x0 x minus x0 over x minus x0, which would be 1. So what have I got so far? I would have f of x0 minus f of x0, that's 0. And then similarly, when you plug in x into this for t, this would be f of x. When I plug in x into that t, this stuff, uh, what, that all goes away. And so what is g of x equal to? Did I do that right? When I plug x into that, yeah g of x should be, oh, let's go back up to f though. What is f of x? Let's see, if you plug in x into right here for all the t's, I see, well, those two would cancel. And when you plug an x in for all these t's, every one of these would be times zero to some power. So this whole expression f of x would be equal to zero. So I hope that that justifies why I'm trying to say down below that g of x should be zero since all you're left with is f of x, and we just said that that's zero. So what can we do? By the way, like f's a nice differentiable function. This is fine, it's differentiable, especially if t is the variable. There's nothing wrong with t in this numerator times this constant. And so, uh, and it's continuous. It satisfies Rolle's theorem. So by Rolle's theorem, since g has the value zero at its endpoints on this interval j, what can you say? There should be some constant between x and x zero so that the derivative is zero. So in other words, like the graph of g has to turn somewhere to get back down to here. It's got to turn. Okay, so thus, what can we say? And here's where we're gonna do a bunch of algebra. Zero is g prime, so I'm just writing it in a different order. But now let's actually calculate the derivative of this expression up here. Let's do that calculus. So this would be f prime of, and by the way, I'm changing to c, like I'm plugging in c, so we'll just change all the t's to c's. So this would be f prime of c. And then when you do the derivative of this good stuff here, remember this blue is a constant, so that's fine. We just need to do the derivative of this. So we'll do the chain rule. So this power n plus one comes down, you need to do that stuff raised to the nth power times the derivative of the inside, which would be minus one over x minus x zero, since this x minus x zero is constant with respect to t and this with respect to c. And so if you simplify all that good stuff, all I'm gonna do is I think I combine these and I think that uh, maybe you notice that you have x minus x zero to the nth times another one would be x minus x zero to the n plus first. And then I just pulled this much x minus x x minus c to the n. Let's pull it out front. So the zero is equal to this good stuff here. And what we're going to try to do is solve this for the blue for f of x zero. And I've colored it blue to remind you that f of x zero is the remainder. It's r n that we talked about above, and that's what we started with maybe up here. f of x zero is r n. So I've changed from this green. I'm changing it to blue now. So we're going to solve this equation, 0 equals this stuff for the blue. 
So what's that look like? So what did I do? I just subtracted this to the other side. And so that would be this stuff here. And if I just divide by this good stuff, I get f of x zero is minus all this good stuff. So notice this is in the numerator now. Notice that uh, this stuff is in the denominator now. And then times f prime of c. So why is that cool? Well, what do I know that f prime of c is? We did that calculation uh, up here. So instead of t, just plug a c in, that's all. And so that's this stuff right here. And maybe you notice that a little bit more cancels, right? These x minus c's to the n cancel. You've got n factorial times the next term, n plus one. If you put those together, that's n plus one factorial. And then last, you see that these minus signs cancel out. So what do you get? You get the pink formula, kind of the next derivative evaluated at that c that Rolle's theorem gave us over n plus one factorial times x minus x zero to the n plus one. So in particular from that proof, that finished the proof, but what is the remainder? It's exactly equal to the n plus first derivative evaluated somewhere, not x zero necessarily, over n plus one factorial times x minus x zero to the n plus first. All right, so why is this useful? Like, what do people use this for? So I'm gonna show you how in the 1700s and 1800s, people were able to calculate the number e and to an error within less than uh, to 10 to the minus fifth power. Another way to think about that is they could get the first four decimal places of e spot on. So I'll show you how to do that by hand. So let's set your function f of x be e to the x. So I know that it's Taylor polynomial from the previous video at x zero is one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus x to the n over n factorial. If you don't recall that, go watch that video right now. And what we're gonna try to do, I wanna figure out what e is. Well, I see e would be the value of at one here. So e would be f of one. And I wanna get that right to 10 to the minus fifth. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this polynomial instead. Right? I don't know much about how this E works, but I do know how to add stuff together, like fractions. That's fine. It might take me a while, but I could do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Rn here, right? I want to make sure that the difference between uh, R, I want, I want to make sure the difference between F of 1 and Pn of 1 is, within, is less than uh, 10 to the minus 5th. So the difference would be the, the error, right? The remainder, Rn of 1. So what is that? Remember, that's the absolute value, f1 minus, well, I guess, sorry, I shouldn't have that here. I want to, because we said it's fine if rn is negative. So I'm just taking absolute value here. When I talk about this, uh, this like actual error here, I want it to be a positive number. So rn is equal to this stuff, but what else have I done? I've taken the absolute value, so I'll take the absolute value of this side too. And I want to make sure that that's less than 10 to the minus fifth. Now, Taylor's theorem, what did it tell me? Taylor's theorem, theorem gave me kind of a foothold for what can I say about Rn for this polynomial? I know a formula for it, sort of. So at least I know what form it has. So by Taylor's theorem, there should be some C between zero and one, so Y zero. Well, zero is where this thing is centered at, and Y one, well, because one gives me the value that I wanna calculate. So X is, so yeah, when X is one, that takes me to where I wanna be here. Anyway, Taylor's theorem tells me that Rn of one is equal to this n plus first derivative evaluated this mystery c, I don't know what it is, but uh, times n plus one factorial, times one minus zero to the nth power, which of course, that's just one at the end there. And so, by the way, e to the x is a cool function because all of its derivatives are itself. So if I'm supposed to just evaluate it at c, that should just be e to the c. So I should just get e to the c over n plus one factorial. So think about what did we wanna do? I wanted to set that less than 10 to the minus fifth power. So that's what we'll do. So I just need to solve this for n to figure out um, how many of these fractions do I need to add up to get this desired accuracy right here to calculate the first four, at least the first four decimal places of e correctly. Now, I don't know what this c is, right? Taylor's theorem is one of those, well, it's a theoretical result. It says c exists. It doesn't tell you what it is or how to find it. So what we need to figure out is, okay, I wanna solve this for n, but what can I say about e to the c? So what is e to the c? So what do you know about c? c is between zero and one. And so if c is between zero and one, e to the c ought to be less than three, right? I mean, at worst, this would be e to the first power, which I know is like 2.7, and people in like the 1700s knew that too. So I know e to the c should be less than three as long as c is between zero and one. So what does it do? What do we want to do then? Well, maybe instead of making this stuff less than 10 to the fifth, negative fifth, maybe I'll just let three uh, over n plus one factorial be less than 10 to the negative fifth. 
So think about it, if this is true, well then this is true also, since the blue is smaller, blue is smaller than this one even. So we'll solve this for n. And you could do that, there's no real cool algebra way to undo this factorial here, so you would just do this by guessing and checking. So another way to think about this inequality, if I multiply, if I really divide this to the other side, and I multiply this to the other side, everything's positive, so it's cool. It's the same thing as three times 10 to the fifth is less than n plus one factorial. And uh, what do we notice here? Something like nine factorial is 362,880. That's bigger than, uh, what, 300,000 here. So that's bigger than three times 10 to the fifth. So uh, nine certainly gets me there. Remember though that this factorial is n plus one factorial. So if nine factorial worked, then n should be eight. So n equals eight. So to put it all together, what do we got? The eighth degree Taylor polynomial for e to the x centered at zero will actually approximate the number e with an error less than 10 to the minus fifth power. And so maybe what you see as well, like for any desired error, any desired level of accuracy, it's always possible to figure out, well, how many terms do I need in the Taylor polynomial to get that desired accuracy? And again, this just says the first four decimal places of P8 of one and E, they match. And maybe one or two more actually do two by chance.